So um, it's a pleasure to uh, announce a kickoff of our uh, online panel, uh, the legal self-service of tomorrow. Uh, obviously, it's inspired by our joint market report. Uh, so between uh, ELTA, the European Legal Tech Association, and Gap App. Um, I'm very happy to have with me today exclusive guests um, and our, I would say, legal tech comrade um, and and uh, one of the people that I value the most in the legal tech ecosystem. Um, and this is not because you participated in our research. This is because it's true. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so I'm happy to have with me today uh, Johan Mann from Norton Rose Fulbright, um, Catherine Bamford from BAM Legal, Mike McGlinchey from uh, Pinst Mason's Vario, and Tracy Gross from DWF. Um, so before I give you the spotlight to briefly introduce yourself, I would just like to start with what actually is self-service. So the whole topic, the, the, the first two editions actually of our market report, um, and entire, entire, actually, all activities are around this phrase self-service. What is legal self-service? So we believe that legal self-service is a system of processes that are automated uh, partially or fully through technology solutions with embedded legal knowledge. So these solutions enable individuals, so users of self-service tools, to input their requests or information at their convenience and instantly, or usually in minutes, receive different legal content from that. So this, this content can be in the form of advice, analytics, reports, or finally documents, right? So for the creators of self-service solutions, most significant benefits are obviously scalability of that service using technology, more efficient service delivery, transparency, and, and insights. So, so far, self-service tool has been used for use cases that are more, I would say, uh, administrative, so less complex, repetitive, and again, more administrative in nature, um, but also use cases with, I would say, a mid-level complexity that are, power, that are powered by more sophisticated technology solutions. So going from repetitive uh, legal processes uh, such as questionnaire or self-assessment uh, based tools to more sophisticated self-service using AI is something that we're going to talk about um, in this panel. So without further ado, uh, I would like you to uh, please to uh, uh, introduce yourself. And yeah, like, <clears throat> uh, uh, ladies first. So uh, we can start from uh, Tracy or Catherine. Please, please go ahead and, and uh, introduce yourselves. Hi, hey everybody. Very nice to meet you all, albeit virtually. My name is Tracy Groves. I am from DWF, which is a global provider of integrated legal and business services. Um, full disclosure, right up front, I'm not a lawyer. So I'm a management consultant and chartered accountant by background, and I lead our client-facing sustainable business and ESG advisory practice for the firm. Mm -hmm. And uh, really excited about the conversation this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. Catherine? Hi, everyone. My name's Catherine Bamford. Um, I run a legal tech consultancy called BAM Legal. We help law firms and in-house legal teams to improve the delivery of their legal services using technology. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, gentlemen, uh, please, uh, Mike, if you will. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to meet you all. Thank you. Um, my name is Mike McGlinchey. I head up the legal technology consulting team here at Pinsett Masons Vario. Uh, Vario, just been a core part of Pinsett Masons, but with the, the professional services arm, the, the new law arm, if you like, of Pinsett Masons. Uh, my background is technology. I'm an old IT guy uh, by background, uh, but for the last 15 years or so. Uh, most of my time has been spent supporting our clients directly uh, with their own legal technology uh, journeys. So yeah, really pleased to be here this afternoon and thanks for the invite. Thank you so much, Mike. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Jochen, please feel Hello, free to Hello everyone. Nice meeting you uh, online. 
My name is Jochen, Jochen Mann. I am a lawyer uh, in the Frankfurt office of the law firm Norton Rose Fulbright. And uh, I have been with Norton Rose for uh, four and a half years now, but um, I'm a veteran uh, in the legal field and have uh, contributed to the latest report um, by describing an online software-based tool that we have developed for uh, in institutional investors, uh, allowing them to check certain very specific questions in 12 different jurisdictions that may be important to them. Amazing. Thank you so much, Johan. Um, so the thing that all of you have in common are you not just talked about uh, legal self-service or legal technology uh, self-service approach, you, I would say, like, like the, uh, they say, walk the talk. So you actually uh, implemented or um, at least used solutions that are in this area. So this is, uh, I think, quite a composition of different profiles, different backgrounds. So from consultancies to lawyers to more tech professionals. And I think it's going to be a really, really interesting uh, conversation um, so again, happy to have you. And uh, for all of you that are watching, buckle up, this is going to be uh, quite a ride. Um, so uh, I would like to start with the first topic. And this was one of our, actually one of our inspirations to start with the, um, uh, the legal self-service of tomorrow report. So according to Walters Kluver, um, almost 80% of lawyers predict more self-service by clients in the next three years. And obviously, this is not a coincidence. Self-service uh, in, in many shapes and forms exists not only in the legal industry, but in financial industry, uh, in, in basically almost all industries um, uh, across, across the globe. And especially, I believe that are, they are very important in the professional industry segment. So we're here to uncover how self-service is used to benefit on the one side, the clients, so individuals and organizations that are using them, but on the other side, the service providers. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to, to have also Catherine that's on the consultancy side, that's helping, uh, she's also helping law firms um, uh, uh, conceptualize and implement these types of solutions. And when we're talking about self-service, it's not just about uh, questionnaire-based self-assessments is also about document animation. So any type of self-service approach, uh, in, again, in many shapes and forms. So the first topic or the first question is, for you, why do you think these almost eight out of 10 lawyers um, are right or perhaps wrong to believe that self-service is going to be a huge part um, of the legal tech industry, maybe we can we can we can go the same way uh, we started with introduction introductions. So Tracy, uh, please feel free to start. Well, thank you. It's, it's a great question to start with, and um, who am I to argue with eight out of ten? That's a pretty high statistic. Well, what I would say, and this is based on our own experience, is. Actually, this is a very empowering and enabling tool that we can offer to our clients. The fact that we are enabling them to do this form of self-assessment and creating their own sense of data um, is really powerful. So personally, and obviously in my work in sustainability, which is absolutely expedited and accelerated through the use of technology, but I'm seeing this across all of the legal services and operations that we offer, the ability to able to co-create something with clients is really important. So it generates a sense of ownership. Um, it really um, uh, brings home this sense of accountability and gives them something that we can work with them on as opposed to doing to them. So I come from this from a position of building trust and rapport with our clients and giving them more flexibility and choices about how they then progress. But for us, it's really about establishing ourselves as trusted advisors and giving them the opportunity to think about what this means and how they would like to take it forward. Yeah, thank you so, so much. I, I, it resonates 100% because in a way, self-service 
invokes a different type of client's uh, law firm relationship, right? Yep. The interaction is a bit different. And it, it I, I think it touches on a very important um, topic is the relationship or the deep personalization of relationship between clients and lawyers that I believe is not the case with mm. uh, a properly utilized self-service approach. It's, it's, it increases transparency. It also increases, I would say, it, it's convenient uh, in a way because modern technologies enable you to have that different experience when interacting with the service itself and with the service provider. So um, I think I think also that's spot on. And the thing about what you said about the data and the thing, especially in your field of work, I think yeah. it's very impactful. Thank you so much. Um, Catherine? Um, I'll be honest and say that I was actually surprised that it was 80% of lawyers that said this. Um, I'm in a, a lucky position and a unique position that um, rather than working for one firm, I get to see what 50 or more different firms are doing. And while I'm a huge advocate for um, client facing products, lead generation tools, also paid services, subscription models, where we, we're offering services to clients in a self-service way or gathering instructions from clients to then feed into our lawyers to just speed up the service delivery. I don't think there's that much going on. Um, there's some really nice little pockets um, and some firms, you know, Mike and I worked on something about 10 years ago um, on this. That was that was one of the first things, I think, um, in this space. But um, yeah, I was surprised by the figure because I don't actually see that much self-service being offered to clients. I think maybe the reason that eight out of 10 lawyers said um, they would is because we all as consumers are mu getting much more used to self-service. So, you know, rather than having to telephone a customer service line, we're used to chatbots these days. We're used to doing a lot of things ourselves, finding information ourselves. So maybe lawyers are going, well, you know, if the, if the question was any more, if it's more than nothing <laughs> or more than very little, then um, it's no surprise that they said there would be, there would be an increase. And I, I think this is um, a very important angle to look at it from, because if you take into consideration, and again, this is the legal industry and legal service, such a broad, uh, I would say, term, includes a lot of different business models, uh, target markets, not the same, B2C, B2B, premium, or more. So there are a lot of nuances, right? But if, if you take into consideration that, you know, ChatGPT is an AI self-service tool, right? So you basically control it on, on your user end and you get some output back, right? And if you take into consideration the adoption level, I think it was like three days to one first one million users. And I think people underestimate the user experience part of the product. They only focused on AI as a technology, but the user experience part of the product, I think was, was, was genius, super simple. But um, I, what I am saying is, uh, yeah, I would just like to add one more question uh, before, before we proceed. So um, if we agree that in the future, people will change the way they like to interact with among that, um, among other other types of service with the legal service, and again, it's not for probably if if your client is is you know Morgan Stanley or J.P. Morgan, it's not going to be that type of service. So it depends on what approach you take. But future generations, uh, and we're here because we we like to talk about the future, not only about the present. Future generations may find. Uh, a self-service approach, judging by all the other stuff they use self-service for, more, I would say, convenient when interacting with legal service. So why do you think at this present moment, because this is your first, I would say, statement, at this present moment, why do you think um, this is not the case? Uh, is it still not the right timing? Or, yeah, just, just want to get your take on that. I just think that it's not being offered by the the law firms or the the legal service providers at the moment, um, so it's not client appetite 
so much. Um, as you say, very, very different from whether, um, you know, you're you're buying a house and it's like online conveyancing or whether you're GC and your multi-million pound company is about to be sued for something. You know, you, sometimes you want to pick up the phone and speak to someone and sometimes you just want to check progress of where things are, you know, or or you're a new business and you want an employment contract. Um, so we're very, very different things. But I just think it's um, at the moment that uh, the, law, the law firms or the legal service providers aren't offering these self-service tools yet because not from any fault of anyone's, um, because the models haven't yet been fully worked out. This is doing something different in a new way. And when you're so busy doing everything that you're currently doing, it's very hard to think about those complete switch and new problems and that's what would be really interesting to hear from the rest of the panel members as to how they've got around that and and how they've 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 done these things 100 uh and uh yeah let's not waste waste any more time let's jump to um uh, uh, the people that are that are already doing it uh so mike uh yeah would love to get your take on this as well um from reducing non-billable efforts. So I would say benefits from the service provider side or the law firm side to all the benefits that the users are, are having. What do you see as, as I would say the best or what's the added value for both sides according to your experience? Yeah, it's interesting. I had exactly the same thought as Catherine. Um, beware of the accuracy of predictions. Um, I think there is, probably more momentum now than there ever has been around utilizing self-service tools. But things like, and Catherine specialist area, document automation has been around for donkey's years, but still hasn't really got the traction that you might expect given that's our industry. We generally produce documents and that automation is there, but it's not as widespread as you might think. I tend to see it from both the law firm perspective and the services that we provide to our clients, but also from talking to clients and in-house teams and how they provide service back internally to their own business customers. So I think combining all of that, there's definitely a driver to really push those self-service tools. Um, and a lot of that is clearly client-led because they're starting to do that internally with their own teams. And I think we'll see that uptake increase because it's easier to deliver. Catherine mentioned the project that we worked on 10 years ago, you know, it involved engineers and coders and pulling something together. Now these tools are much more easily accessible. So the gap between the knowledge expert and the technical solution is, is much smaller now. Um, so the no code, low code variety of solutions, I think are going to really drive this forward and getting that knowledge out. But we are a knowledge business, aren't we? And getting that knowledge out and available was a tricky thing to do. You know, it's not easy to always do that and maintain it and keep it up to date so it's always correct and relevant. And there's probably, from a law firm perspective, a bit of a, a risk concern there. Well, what if my advice is no longer relevant? What if something has changed? I'm busy doing my day-to-day -day work. Have I remember to go and update that online tool because there's a new act that's come into play as of today. So I think there are, there are multiple challenges there, but I think that's certainly been countered a lot by the, the availability and accessibility and just making it easier for the knowledge experts themselves to, 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 service, to service those clients who, who need it and want to use it more as well. Um, yeah, and, and do you think, you know, in, in your opinion, again, this is a, a, a very broad topic, but in your opinion, how will AI influence that part of self-service that requires a more complex, I would say, legal content output, right? So, you know, so far we've been, and again, you're, you're, I, th I think you're the most senior technical person in this room, in this virtual room, um, with, with bearing in mind your, your background. Um, what do you think are is the game changer when it comes to self-service and AI comparing to, I would say, uh, decision tree reasoning uh, and and these, I would say, self-assessments for specific uh, types of services? Yeah, I mean, 
clearly the, the, the great white hope that is AI, I think it will make a big difference. Uh, and I think it comes back to that point about being a knowledge business. If you can access generally unstructured knowledge stored across a multitude of systems and present that back, and if that's your source, and if you're confident that source is accurate, then as these AI tools improve and are so accessible from a, a language machine uh, interface, then I think that really will drive a, a lot of the, the increase in the uptake. People are familiar with using these tools, are familiar with the chatbots, but as you say, maybe you know, a lot of the ones we did earlier were very much that decision tree basis. And you're trying to think of every eventuality. And no two cases the same, even in a conveyancing thing, there's always something that's slightly different. Um, and when we've tried to automate, you know, debt recovery processes or conveyancing processes, you do the broad big stuff, but, you know, once you get into some of the nuances, it's lost. I think the AI tools are going to help cover a multitude without having to think in advance what might happen here and giving the power back to the end user to say, well, where do I want this conversation to go? Rather than it being very constrained by what you've written down and ending up with a, uh, uh you need to speak to someone type, um, answer and we all get frustrated with that and are consumer lives when these online tools where it's buying insurance and so on can are, are limited and don't answer the question you want so I think having access to that knowledge and the Gen AI tools being able to present that back and act as that interface will be you know the, the game changer in driving a lot of these tools forward um, yeah 100% I think the the parts where we like to imagine that the tool needs to do everything. I think this is where we need to kind of think a little bit outside of the box. Obviously, bearing in mind uh, the hats that I'm wearing, uh, even on, on this call, uh, both on the Elta side as director for Southeast Europe and CEO of Gap App, being familiar with, I would say, and, and I, I believe that Catherine also does that, does this in consulting, you know, decomposing legal processes and seeing what you should, I would say, delegate to the tool or what the tool should cover. And where is that hard stop saying, okay, you need to speak to someone. And, you know, again, this is the same process as in, in the medical industry and, and um, uh, the, uh, and this is getting more popular um, in uh, customer care. So always the, Part of it is automated, but you, when you get to the point that you actually need to speak to someone, you have to have that option. So I think balancing out what will the, the, the solution do, what will the tool do, and where do you come in as a law firm saying, okay, this was self-service, now it's our turn. You know, Now we're the superheroes, now we're coming in, and now we're uh, uh, um, uh, helping you personally with the solution. And I think knowing how to balance these two will be the key. And uh, when when we're talking about that, we'd love to hear um, uh, Johan's take, uh, how, in his opinion, can that balance be achieved? So if an organization is using self-service, where is that hard stop where you come in and just do the old school um, uh, legal service delivery directly to the client? Johan, what do you think? The way I see it is like this. On the one, there is like a spectrum. On the one hand, there's the letter of the law. You can read the law as such. You don't understand a single word. And on the other hand, there's a sophisticated person, at least, you know, an expert in their particular field of law that can answer all the questions, okay? And then the question is, how do we bridge that difference? And um, self-help tools can help do that, okay? And, um, and then there's this risk um, evaluation that you just mentioned, Serge. The way we approach this is our tool is capable of identifying harmless cases, right? The way in which it is programmed and the way in which the questions and answers are given enables the user, even if they don't have a legal education or practice, um, they just need to be, to be familiar with the business they're in. 
So it enables them to identify use cases that are harmless. They get a green light, so to speak, you know, when it comes to the results of the questionnaire that they have to follow through. Um, and it also has, you know, like a traffic light system, uh, orange and red lights, okay? But if we reach that level, we don't draw specific legal conclusions. We, we give warnings that are gradu graduated, so to speak, right? So yellow could mean in our world that it's what you're doing or what you're proposing to do based on the info that you fed into our tool is not per se forbidden or illegal. And it doesn't result necessarily in fines, but you have to take action. You know, you may have to publish a notice. You have to do this or that, you know, or else. And then we describe the sanctions that are tied to inaction, for example. Or, you know, in extreme cases, uh, they get a red light as a result. And um, in that case, we would say, you know, you may have violated this or that, but we don't say you have. We just say you may have vi violated this or that. You know, stop doing what you have been doing so far. You know, speak to your compliance department, speak to your legal department. Okay, be very, very careful now because if you have screwed up, um, you know, you may be liable uh, and there may be very serious fines or or other legal consequences or sanctions, etc. So that's how we try to um, divide the um, the part where the client can help themselves uh, with confidence you know, if they get the green light and the parts where they have to call their legal department or us to get much more expert advice. And that's also, in my view, one of the big advantages of developing such tools because you create expert knowledge, even if in a narrow field, but in-depth expert knowledge of the field that you have developed the tool for, okay? And that also gives you a certain reputation in the market, you know, uh, with or without the tool, you know, people start calling you to ask for advice in that particular area that you are known for because you have developed such a tool. So these are my initial thoughts on your question, Serge. Can I can I just ask you? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sure. Um, yeah. It just sounds fascinating. The the tools. Can can we just go back and just you mentioned that it was about several countries, but what what is the actual tool? Uh, okay, uh, I'll try to, it's it's a, it's a bit complicated, but I'll summarize it as good as I can. This tool is developed for institutional investors that hold shares in numerous investee companies, investment funds, pension funds, family offices, you know, stuff like that. Insurance companies that have to invest their money, et cetera. And in this day and age, they try to um, implement more and more green ideas into their investment companies and also their investors, the, the ones that invest the money that is then reinvested by the institutional investors, like owners of mutual fund shares, you know, for example, those guys, they want to invest in socially and environmentally conscious uh, investments. So they want to know from those institutional investors how responsibly they have invested their money, okay? So this is all kinds of consequences. But one consequence is that such investors cooperate with each other to basically agree on a strategy in relation to each and every single investee company, you know, less plastic, better working conditions, um, less pollution, more green projects, et cetera, stuff like that. And that cooperation, or it's also it's called um, collaborative engagement, is can be very risky from an old school legal point of view. And that depends very much on the jurisdiction they're working in. 
For example, the, the lowest threshold is this. If you work together with other shareholders, all of you hold voting rights in that company. And we assume that the target companies are all stock exchange listed. So if your cooperation exceeds a certain intensity, you are no longer viewed by the law as single investors. You are grouped together and are treated as one and the same investors. All the voting rights held by all 10 or 12 cooperators uh, or collaborators are added up. They are attributed to each other. So instead of 0.5, you suddenly hold six or seven percent together, okay? And that may result in obligations to publish your shareholding, okay, in case of listing. So it's a way, sorry to interrupt, I'm just conscious that I've just taken up loads of someone's time by asking that question. But So it's a way for people to check um, the particular sanctions and the rules within that country exactly. self-service. Understood. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. If, 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 I, if, if I may just uh, jump in. So whoever is watching, uh, you can uh, easily download. The boy is going to drop uh, the report, the PDF. Uh, you can also check our LinkedIn page uh, or also Elta, all Elta channels, <clears throat> where all of these use cases are. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. <clears throat> where all of these use cases are displayed. So before we proceed, and I would like to uh, talk about each and every use case for a little bit. But before we proceed, um, Joachim, you mentioned a while ago, I think this was the first time we had a conversation. You mentioned that the actual, the inspiration for the tool was that one of the clients wanted to have a solution so wanted to have a automated way of uh, checking it i'm not going into uh, obviously who the client is i'm just curious about you know is the demand or has the demand come from the market uh, and was that I, I would say a driver for you to get in uh, to developing the tool very briefly, if you can, please, <laughs> just being... Uh, I'm going to be very of... brief. I already described main, how <laughs> the tool works, and let me just add one thing. One of the main reasons and one of the main requests of that particular client, which we implemented, is that all the information entered and all the results received are stored in a dashboard. So this tool doesn't forget anything. And that is very useful for any kind of future use. First of all, internal use for business purposes. You know, how did we behave last year? What did we agree on? Who did we collaborate with, et cetera, et cetera. But then also uh, audits, uh, you know, annual audits by the auditors, compliance um, uh, requirements until uh, uh, even you know um, um, audits by the regulator, okay? Um, any kind of legal trouble, you can always pull out the stuff that you did three years ago and prove what you what you checked and which info you provided to the tool before you went to the general shareholders meeting of that particular company. Okay, okay. Um... And again, I think that was uh, that that was the main point where uh, it wasn't just your perception that the market needed that. You had validation from the client that you helped in, uh, I would say, the old-fashioned way that they would benefit from this kind of service. And, and I think this is one of the most important uh, drivers of like, technology adoption in general. So it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Do you uh, build, a, uh, uh, I would say, roadmap, strategy, solutions based on the market, or it's you offer, you you provide uh, a solution on the supply side and then generate demand from the market? So I think this is very much connected to what Catherine mentioned before, is that we're not seeing this so uh, uh, so much right now but can expect more self-service tools in the future. And there it's only two reasons. Either law firms and legal service providers are going to push this or 
the demand is going to come from the client side or from the business side. But again, uh, it's a chicken and egg thing. And uh, obviously it's not, there are a lot of shades of gray. It's not uh, black or white. So Tracy, please, if, if you can, re oh, so, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, we can, we can basically start the circle again. Um, so just a brief intro of what does your tool do? So just because again, you know, talking theoretically is okay. And we can talk about uh, uh, abstract uh, uh, self-service approaches, but I think the best way to illustrate the benefits is going through a very, uh, the success stories. And this is why we're all here. So please, uh, if you can briefly describe um, your uh, use case, self-service use case. Sure, thank, thank you very much. And, and fascinating to hear all the different perspectives. So. We have, this is one of a number of self-service tools that we've developed in-house um, in DWF. And this one in particular is looking at some new EU uh, legislation which is coming in with regards to corporate sustainability. So it's relating to the EU Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive or the CSDDD, as some people may know it. But essentially what we're trying to do is many clients just don't know where to start. There is a tsunami of regulation of new laws coming down the line in the next two to three years and more, not just in the EU, but other ways, which is looking for organisations to provide evidence of not just what they say they are doing, but what they are actually doing with regards to a whole raft of sustainability related issues, in particular environment and human rights for this particular one. So what we've done is develop this tool, which is effectively a self-assessment on a risk basis of where organizations currently are. So it gives them a baseline of where they're at in terms of being able to meet the requirements of the new directive, which will become law enshrined in the local territories. So effectively, what we're trying to do is to give organizations the momentum. It's a bit, you know, the, the downside of doing nothing is your risk amplifies, yeah, you are caught on the back foot and you're waiting for the law to be, you know, the I's to be dotted, the, the T's to be crossed, and effectively you have less time to actually prepare. So we're positioning this as a preparedness tool to enable and give sight, to give vigilance, to give awareness of what needs to be done. So organisations, even though they may not have to actually report on this until 2027, yeah, which is the first wave of large scale organisations, the fact is they can start now in terms of their supply chain, their value chain, their customers, their suppliers, their employees, to think about what they need to do. So that's really at the, at the heart of it. It's accelerating progress. It's unsticking. Can I say that? You know, with organizations that get stuck and they're paralyzed and don't know where to start, this gives them that platform, that opportunity to move, and actually gives them the confidence to say, actually, here's what we're doing, which is working. Here's what we're not doing. We need to get our act together and to make that happen. Um, amazing. And uh, I, I think that it's always, you know, the first step, you know, knowing where you are, knowing where, uh, how, how to coordinate future activities, knowing where to start, having a roadmap, having like a, you know, it's it, the core, um, I would say, purpose is getting relevant information instantly or very fast. And it's, in my opinion, one of the biggest barriers in the in legal industry is actually access to the service, right? So if, if you take that into consideration, you're not actually 100% solving the problem, but you, through self-service, you're instantly generating some content where, yeah. you know, you're helping people. So I, you know, I think that that's, that's a very, very important point. And, uh, Thank you so much for, again, amazing, amazing work. Um, so, uh, Mike, um, I'd love to hear more about um, uh, your use case. Um, I think it's a slightly different perspective. And I think, uh, and I would love to hear also, obviously, that win-win scenarios. What are the benefits from uh, for the user side or for the client side and also for the law firm side? Because... That win-win is always a, in my opinion, a principle uh, where everybody needs to win, right? So, uh, and and uh, all stakeholders uh, must have, you know, uh, uh, a uh, a good scenario for them. So, um, 
I would love to hear more about your uh, sure. use case. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Tracy made a really good point earlier on about the need for data and the better use of data. And often when we talk to clients around their use of legal technology, it can be quite vague sometimes of what it is they're trying to achieve. And we had a lot of conversations with clients that seem to point towards contract life cycle management technology. That's a pretty broad topic, it covers a whole range of things from the intake process to drafting to negotiation all the way through to post signature management. But we kind of had that sense that is that what clients are telling us? How far um, are we understanding the market? So part of the reason for our tool, which is a contract lifecycle management assessment tool. So it allows our clients to use the tool and assess their own maturity on their contracting processes and contracting technology. Uh, for their specific needs. So what it, what is it they're actually interested in doing? Uh, is it drafting? Is it contract storage? Is it some of the more advanced features? And, and so clients couldn't really articulate that. And we couldn't, we had this anecdotal evidence, but didn't really have anything substantial to say, yeah, this is really what the position of the market is. And at the same time, many organizations would say to us, oh, we're way behind the curve. Everybody else is ahead of us. We're, we're nowhere. We really need some help. And almost everybody we speak to says the same thing. So how do you get some sort of uh, metrics around that to, to really help clients put benchmarking in place to say, well, this is where we are now, or this is where we were last year, and providing some metrics for themselves. I think that's a big win for them. It helps them think about all of the aspects of the, the contracting process. It helps them determine what's useful and relevant to them. And then it helps them measure over time. And then if we can build up that data set from a benchmarking perspective, then we can play that back and say, well, actually, yeah, you're doing really great. And here's where the rest of the market is, or here's where your peers are and your industry are. So I think that data part of it becomes uh, really powerful. So from that, I guess, win-win perspective, it gives the client something that they can just start with. It can help them articulate better what it is they're trying to achieve. Um, where they are, what things they need to be thinking about. Uh, and then for us, building up that data set. And then when we have the conversation with the client, we're much better informed in terms of their specific needs, what it is they're trying to do. And if we can then over time help them play back some of that benchmarking data as well, then you know it, it starts to really drive the, the conversation in terms of what, what do we do next? You know, what do we really need? And where actually are we in terms of you know where we need to be? Um, yeah, and you know what I liked about your use case, it's not uh, you know tightly connected to any regulation, so it's not exactly um, super instrumental for the legal industry, but it's more focused on the processes, not on legal content or regulation per se. So it it also shows you the length of uh, the impact that self assessments can have in the legal industry that are not necessarily focused on a specific regulation, which is usually the case, right? And um, also, you know, talking about the maturity level and talking about, uh, and this is this is, uh, I think, a very a very interesting analogy. So. If we talk about legal transformation, so contract lifecycle management, there the transformation actually never stops because there's always that new thing, that new technology, that new approach that you need to see where you are at comparing from, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, last year or whatever. So being able always to um, uh, measure up how mature are you in, in, in implementing certain technologies? This process is actually a, a something, a job that can never be 100% done because there's always something new. And in a way, it also applies to regulation. There are always, there's always some new regulation or amendments that can change your client's perspective or status. So, you know, uh, the, the, there is no finish line. I'm now stealing, you know, uh, uh, slogans from sports brands, but... Essentially, there is no finish line 
There is no end of use cases when talking about self-assessment because you always need to measure up to some new standard of where you want to be in the future. Uh, and I think this is this is 100% relevant, not only for law firms, but for uh, for their clients as well. So um, I, I see there. that... Yep. So, yep. Sorry, sir, just on that process point, you're right, all the new technologies keep coming along and sometimes that's the driver. All oh, right, we need to be using no code or we need to be using AI or we need to be using Gen AI. Well, actually, what have we done to set the framework and the foundations to use these tools? Do you have templates? Do you have processes? Do you have mandates defined? You know, you keep chasing the technology, but there's some groundwork that needs to be done first. And so our tool kind of helps think about, you know, highlighting some of those areas that needs to be focused on as well. Yeah, and I think this is a perfect time to to uh, circle back to Catherine. Um, so when you want, let's say you're a law firm, you want to start with the self-service approach. You like what uh, this panel uh, 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 said about uh, self-service solutions. You like the use cases. You like the people. I want to start. Coming back to what also Mike mentioned. So putting all the processes first in place. So then seeing where that self-service can be implemented, which technologies, is it going to be a no-code, low-code? Are you going to develop something from scratch to be focused only on your use case? So what do you see as the first step, I would say, to uh, building a self-service tool? I remember the first time I we actually... Uh, um, uh, got in touch with, uh, um, I think you posted something about, yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if you could do this instead of that? And that was like uh, a, a really good example of, of self-service and resonated with me. So I think you're a perfect person to, to uh, ask, you know, what, are, what was the first step if you want to build your own uh, legal tech self-service tool? Sure. Um, I think you there's you need to think about what it is you want to achieve. Um, is it lead generation? So there's tools out there, for example, um, where you can, if you're forming a new company, you can go to like, for example, Lathan and Watkins have one um, where you can go on, and uh, if you're registering a company in uh, Delaware. You can fill in all your details and get all of the company and corporation documents that you need. They've done that for free as a lead generator in the hope that if you become the new Facebook, you're going to go to them with all your company queries and problems. So that's a self-service tool that's a lead generator. That might be what you want to do. It might be that you have a client that you work very, very closely with. You've worked with them for years and they regularly come to you, maybe currently have like some form of like bank of hours for a helpline or something where you give them so many hours to answer quick queries, that kind of thing. Maybe you want to give a self-service frequently answered questions tool. And that's where what Mike said becomes extremely important, where you need to have stored all the answers you've previously given them, or you need to get that out of your lawyer's heads into some form of content that you can then use a no code, low code, um, or, um, you know, a kind of a, a gen AI chatbot type solution to give it. So there's um, the example out there at the moment where um, it's not legal, but Klarna have replaced 80% of all their customer inquiries with this kind of gen AI chatbot. Uh, but the only way they were able to do that was they had to put a lot of work into curating their knowledge and their frequently asked questions to be able to build that back. So that might be another way. And that might be, so the first step of that one would be, get your knowledge down somewhere first. Um, and as Mike said, it can be unstructured. So it could be that you point it to everywhere you've answered that client previously, if that was by email, for example, or in writing. Um, or it could be that you want to change the way you make money. So rather than charging clients per deal or by the hour, um, fixed fee type thing, it might be that you want to offer a subscription service where every time they onboard someone, they want to have an employment contract generated. So there's lots of different tools you want. So the first thing is to understand fully your your what and your why, and that's getting your team together to, you know, blue sky think, what are all the possible things? Um, start with your low hanging fruits. Think of what it is every day that you do over and over and over again 
as opposed to the stuff where you're really engaging your brain and being challenged and solving hard problems. Think about what it is you do all the time and then think, is there a better way we can deliver this service to our clients? Yeah, you basically uh, covered most of our use cases in GAPAP. It's, it's, um, I think, uh, like, in, like with branding, right? You, you, and with strategy, you always need to find an X factor. I think Tracy's um, saying she had to yeah, jump off there. Yeah, bye, Tracy. Uh, so you always need to find your secret recipe, your X factor for your own organization. Even if you're a full service law firm, you're not the same as your competitor. You need to differentiate, right? So uh, when we talk about self service, in, in my opinion, it's 90% um, <laughs> of our strategy. Again, what you said, like, what do you want to accomplish? Are you more for G uh, 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 lead gen? Are you more for, um, I don't know, like automating a 200 uh, question form and helping your clients with compliance. So these are the things that you need to figure out and then, you know, go to processes, go to, uh, and, and obviously the technology solution you want to, uh, you want to have, um, and you want to use for this. And it sounds like simple, you know, I'm, um, I love the, the, the Klarna example because yeah, spoiler alert with our new edition of, of the legal self service of tomorrow, uh, report we're going to focus on GCs and on um, I would say innovation legal innovation executives uh, in in uh, corporations um, and one of our uh, first we yeah, have this public information because we already uh, uh, published this on LinkedIn um, we're talking to an ex legal COO of UBS Group and we were actually talking about starting points when you want to because you don't start with Chat GPT, you know, this is a, a, a chatbot, an AI chatbot is where potentially you want to end or where you want to go. But building templates, standardizing FAQ, standardizing content, standardizing um, different different requests is, is actually where you start process wise. So I think that that's a really really good um, really good advice for everyone who wants to uh, who wants to start with their own. Uh, self-service tool. So um, we're going to wrap this up. I'm going to ask you please to finish up with, I would say, uh, doesn't have to be one sentence, but really short description of the most important thing uh, about your project and in general, Catherine, if you know, your, your, your role is slightly different about self-service in general. So what do you think is super important like a, a wrap up um, to for all for all for the audience to take home and think about uh, uh, when this panel is finished. Yeah, because uh, Tracy Tracy is gone, so she's she's on the call. Uh, Catherine, you can you can uh, you can start. Sorry to put you in the spot right now. <laughs> uh, no problem. Um, <clears throat> one really important top tip when you're thinking about self service. Um, Get your uh, your own lawyers, so your law firm's lawyers, involved early. Often um, you can come up with the best idea, find all the best technology, and then there's questions come later about the actual like SLAs, so the service level um, agreements. So, you know, if you've offered something, especially that a client's going to pay for, um, and then something breaks in the middle of the night and they can't get access to it and they're reliant on it. Those kind of things can really delay projects. I'm speaking from experience later down the line. So involve them really, really early would be my top tip. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Mike? I'm not going to talk about our use case. I was going to talk more about the, the use case we see from our clients and house teams and the self-service tools that they're looking to achieve, intake systems, docking automation, et cetera. And one part of the desire for that is, is trying to manage the demand to the legal team. If you can push that back to the business, they can get a faster service, they can deal with it. And then it's only the high risk and the, um, the, the meaty stuff that has to come through to, to legal. I guess the only point, 
I would say to that is that sometimes the success of these systems can actually drive more work to your legal teams. So you might be thinking, oh, great, a, a, a legal front door is going to alleviate demand. I'm going to have a bit more time to focus on X. Well, actually, it might drive more demand because you're making your team, your legal team, more accessible, more visible. People are going to be drawn to it more. And yeah, there might be more complex queries coming through, but you get, you're seeing that now, whereas previously without those self-service tools, then they weren't even hitting legal at all. So I guess it's just that caveat. Don't expect necessarily your workload to decrease by the use of these tools. It could actually have an opposite effect. Yeah, and, and again, it depends on the strategy that you want to take. If you're a law firm, maybe you want to initiate growth, maybe you want to facilitate growth, maybe you want to be more accessible. Maybe again, <clears throat> just knowing what the potential scenarios are, I think is 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 also very very um, important when planning uh, to launch a tool. So thank you so much, Mike, for that. Uh, you can. Do you have any any uh, uh, words to wrap up? Famous last words. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, what our clients appreciate about working with our tools is really the ability to free up legal and compliance resources in-house that do no longer have to spend a lot of time on repetitive work, but then instead can concentrate on the really complicated questions that pop up from time to time. That's what they really like about this. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much, uh, guys. It, it's been a privilege. Um, and I hope that this panel helps someone uh, think differently about what and how can self-service help their organization. Um, doesn't matter if they're on the client side or on the service provider side. Um, I, I think this, this, was, uh, this was amazing. I told you gonna, you guys are going to, going to be great. Uh, so thank you again and uh, to all Alta folks for um, the organization and yeah, um, it's been a, it's been an honor. Thank you so much. Thanks to you. Cheers. All the best. Have a good day. Bye.